able to really figure stuff out and realize when you mess up and when you don't mess up. What, this equation is correct. I was using it as an example to describe the trade-off between R squared and standard error yesterday, indicating that if R squared goes up, the standard error will go down, which is both of which desires. Um, and my point that I was making yesterday is that the standard error, arguably, in my mind, is more interpretable than the R squared value, especially when you're looking at increasing R squared or decreasing standard error. When you make a decrease, you can easily interpret what that is interpreted uh, as a for standard error. R squared is not so clear in the ratio. But one, my point that I'm making here today is that I said in the previous class that R squared is really a kind of a nebulous statistic to look at to judge a model because I can see compute R squared before I even build a model. And R squared is simply the square of the covariate of the correlation coefficient x and y. However, <laughs> I realized after I was being asked some questions yesterday, I was like, well, hang on. If I can pre-compute R squared, I can also just as well pre-compute standard error, right? Because I know k is 2, I know n is the number of data points I have. Pre-computed r squared, the total sum of squares is simply the variance of y. y minus y bar squared divided by n. So all of those are constants. I can also pre-compute the standard error just as well as I can the r squared value prior to even building the model. None of those calculations up there require me to know what v0 and v1 are, the model coefficients. So it makes the question again, what, what are we really evaluating with this statistic? I still come back to the point that standard error is a better metric than r squared, but both surprise me that we can calculate them without building a model. It's the only model I'm aware of in data analysis where you can calculate your key metric that you evaluate the model on before you build the model. Other models that I've built, you must do the work before you can calculate the metric. This one, I can calculate the metrics in the R scores metric before you build the model. So again, it makes me question what, what the value of these least squares models are, if you can, or what the, I should say, what the value of the, the metrics are. Anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd complete the picture and not make it appear so that I'm so biased against R squared. It's actually standard error, we get the same problem. So, in today's class, what I'm going to focus on is the confidence interval of E0 and E1. And I'm going to do it via this example that's in your slides. Really early on in slide 32, we have this column of x, we have this column of y. And my intention in today's class is to look at the confidence interval, but also to introduce the use of R for building linear models. Many of you have probably attempted to use R in this current assignment that we just handed in. But I will I show formally here how to use our four linear models and show you a few of the details that may not be immediately apparent. So we had that data set up there and there were some pre-computed values. We had the, the cross product between x and y. We also had xi minus xi bar over there. xi minus xi bar, sum of squares of those terms. And that we were told is 110. Now, just bear in mind, as I mentioned yesterday, the moment we divide that by n, it essentially becomes the variance. So this term over here is nothing more than the variance of x. So x minus x bar, when we see this, and this comes up frequently in our models, is actually n times the variance of x. would be another way to say that. So it's just a scalar multiple of my variance. And in the example, so let's go on, skip, uh, let's go forward back to where we were with left with yesterday. We were looking at constructing these confidence for V0 and V1. And just to emphasize what, what some of the theory here, we have that my confidence interval for V1, I'll just focus on V1 because that's usually the most useful confidence interval we're, we're concerned with, but the construction of V0 is identical, is equal to this upper and lower bound given by the critical value from the normal distribution, assuming we know the variance of V1. So we don't know the variance of V1, I should say, we don't know the variance of beta 1, 
beta 1 is unknown to us, as is the variance of beta 1. So what we, what we, do, what we do, though, is we say, well, I'm going to estimate that variance, and then I write the variance of d1. So d1 is an estimate of beta 1, and now the moment I'm estimating things, I use the critical values from the t distribution. So I, I didn't quite make that distinction clear yesterday. I just wanted to emphasize we started with the normal distribution, recognize we do not know this variance of beta 1. Let's estimate beta 1 with b1. So b1 is equal to beta 1 hat. There's another way of saying that. So the moment we put a hat on our letters, we're saying it's an estimate of. So b1 is an estimate of beta 1. And then we can use the t distribution. Messy derivation, though, for variance of B1. In, in, the, in the printed notes, if you're interested, you can certainly go through the derivation. It's not that hard, but not the primary objective of this course. So let's go and just simply use the result. We'll also introduce, by the way, some slightly new notation. The variance of A B1 is the standard error squared of B1. So we're going to get used to this concept in these ways that when we refer to standard errors, that they refer to variances, um, or the standard error squared is a variance. And it's equal to the standard error from the model. So just simply SE by itself. Standard error of the model residuals over Xi minus X bar. So there's that variance term again, the variance of my X data. So the derivation for that is in the notes, as I said, but it comes down to simply being the ratio of two variances. The variance of my residuals divided by this constant multiple of the variance of my x data. And I'll just add here to completeness, note that the standard error is equal to the regression sum of square, uh, the residual sum of squares, pi squared divided by n minus k. So this is the variance of my residual. So this is what we covered, we covered yesterday. So I can now easily go ahead and compute this confidence interval. So lower bound and upper bound. I know D1 is calculated for my model. CT is the critical value from the T distribution with n minus k degrees of freedom. And then standard error of B1 is this term over here. I take my model's residuals and I calculate the standard error, divide it through by n times the variance of the x, or another way of saying that is, is that summation term over there. So for that data set that's on, on in, in your notes, we can go through those calculations. They're done for you over here in this slide. So the standard error can be calculated, 1.237, square it, divided through by x minus x bar squared. Let's take the sum of that. One issue is in your slides, I have the correct notation here, I just switched these two numbers around. So what's in red now is the correct version. You can just update your slides, if you've got the printed there in front of you with those correct, corrected values. I'll just take, make note of that standard error here of E1 is calculated as 0 0.1179. So in tests and exams, I don't expect you to calculate these things. What I'm going to show you now after this is how to use the software output in R and get these numbers. No sense in making mistakes calculating the sum of squares of all the residuals in the data set. No sense in calculating and typing this all into your calculator and, and messing up the one digit of getting a denominator and numerator correct. So what we will do, use is the software output. A key skill from this course is to recognize which parts of the software output you need in order to do these calculations. Now the software output from R is a pretty standard format, but many of you will not be using R in the future. You may be using SAS or Jump or Stats models if you're using Python, or you may use the output from Excel even. Or, or MATLAB. But all of these outputs from these different software packages look different, but they use the same names for, for the same, same uh, entries in their analysis of various tables. So a key skill is to identify those names and know what that means. 
the software is not going to write for you STB1. They'll just call it standard error of B1 or standard error of the slope. So you have to recognize and translate that that software output means this term over here. Okay? So what I will do for you is in several exercises, I will show you a software output for different software packages. And you need to become comfortable in recognizing what those various parameters are in the table. And then from that, you're able to then go ahead and help with the confidence. So for B1 then, if we just complete this calculation up here in this example, so if I unpack this confidence interval, you would get, you would get the following, you would get minus B, uh, you would get B1, you would get B1 minus CT times the square root of the variance of B1, beta 1, and then I'll the right hand side is symmetrical to that. Or we could write it as B and CT times the standard error of B1. So to compute the lower bound or upper bound, you need these three individual values. There's the slope coefficient, the CT value, and the standard error. So I've gone ahead and substituted those in over there, and we get those lower bounds and upper bounds for B1. Let's try to take a look at what that means and interpret it graphically here. So immediately, the first thing we notice is the confidence interval does not span zero, indicating to me that that B1 coefficient I've calculated from this different data set is x plotted against y. So these are just these circular, uh, on my circular dots on my raw data points. x plotted against y, and the red line is my regression line. That regression line is the line with a slope of 0 0.5. So B1 was 0.5 in this example. That's the red line drawn over there. The first thing, as I, know, as I mentioned, I note is that this bound does not span 0. So that regression slope is significant. There is a definite positive correlation between x and y in this example. But the confidence interval is interpreted in the same way we interpreted confidence intervals earlier. It, it says, if I took another data set, another vector of x and another vector of y, and I recalculated the slope, I'm going to get a new estimate of B1. And I can do that a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time. And I can keep going and recalculate that. And this CT value is the 95% confidence, it's saying, that there's a 95% confidence that that bound uh, contains the true value of B1, or, or I should say contains the value beta 1. So this is an estimate then of the range which will contain beta 1. And what I've drawn here, and it hasn't come out that clearly as I'd hoped, are the two extreme slopes. So here's the slope 0.76, it's a steeper slope, and 0.233 is a, is a less steep slope. All of those uh, those two slopes are drawn for you over there, and they all pass through the center point of the model. So one thing we've learned earlier on is that the model will always pass through x bar, y bar. This mean of x, mean of y will always be the pivot point of your regression model. So that's what that asterisk represents over there. But it, it indicates to you that the, the, the ranges of the slope that we could, could have expected uh, in, uh, the maximum and the minimum limit are shown over there. And for a, for a case where this, this confidence interval might span zero, then you're going to get slopes, one slope that's negative and another slope that's positive, indicating to you that there is really no potential relationship there between x and y. Okay, so the confidence interval of the slope coefficient is interpreted in the same way as you interpret any other confidence interval. Now, the other thing to recognize is, from this calculation up here, that this confidence interval's width is going to be only affected by this term over here. For a given data set, CT is constant. For a given data set, E1 that you calculate, the slope is constant. The only way that that confidence interval can be made broader or narrower is by, by adjusting the standard error. So we said last class that we really want the standard error of B1 to be small. And the way to make it small is by reducing our standard error of the model or increasing the variance of X, so increasing the range over which 
that the slope is calculated. So let's take a look at, at some techniques to do this in the software. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll do this interactively in R. With this uh, data set is x and y. So I, I've typed that in for you already, x, x and y. And one of the first things to do is, is also, of course, plot, plot the data set. So up there is the relationship between x and y. Positive correlation, we expect to see a positive slope coefficient. Now, as, as you, how many of you used R for this the current assignment handed? Yeah, okay, so most of you did. So the terminology here in R that you're now familiar with is to say model.ls, um, model.v squares, or whatever you'd like to call it, is equal to LM. LM is the R command for linear model. It's a very, very generic function. It can build far more than just least squares models. It does all linear models, which is a huge, huge variety of models. LM is linear model. So then we use the terminology of Y tilde X. So Y tilde X says regress Y onto X. So let's take special note of this terminology. Regress Y onto x is what that command is saying. We always regress a y onto an x, or regress a y onto multiple x's. We'll, we'll, we'll see that later on. Well, now we're just working with a single x variable, but we always regress a y onto x. So when you hear me say that, regress temperature onto viscosity, or regress the, disc, the time taken versus the reaction rate, you have to be clear which is which, right? Which is my y and which is my x. You always regress a y onto the x. You don't regress an x onto the y. You may think that that sounds natural to regress an x onto a y, but it's not. You regress a y onto an x. That's standard statistical terminology. So it says regress y onto x. Another way that people like to interpret this, and I find this more natural as well, is to say, when I'm saying lm, y, x, it says find me the linear model where y is described by x. So the tilde you can interpret as is described by. So y is described by x. Later on, we're going to see in the, in, uh, in the course, we're going to write things such as y is x1 plus x2. So that says, give me the linear model where y is described by x1 plus x2. That R will build you a linear model that goes y is equal to b0 plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2. Okay, so R will build the general linear model that way. We're going to look at nonlinear transformations. So we can take, build, find me the linear model where y is described by x1 plus the log of x2. So R will build that for you as well. You'll see that coming up. So the tilde notation is, a, is, a, is an operator in R that has a very special meaning for described R. So when I say that, then R goes ahead and builds the linear model. And now if I type model.ls, I get a very cursory summary of what's, that, what's in that model. It simply tells me what the regression coefficient is, the intercept and the slope. So the intercept of 0.3, the slope of Five. You can get far more useful summary information by using the summary command. Summary model.l is tells me quite a bit more information. It tells me how this model was originally built. So the first output is tells me how did you originally build this linear model? What was the formula that you used? It gives me a five-number summary of my residuals. It tells me the minimum and the maximum of the residuals, the median, and then the first and third quarter. So this is called the five-number summary. I get a very quick idea of what my residual span looks like. So if the residuals as low as minus 1.9, as large as 1.8, my typical residual should be in the order of zero. We look for a median residual of zero. The next important output is the slope coefficients, so 0.3 and 0.5, I'm sorry, 3.0 and 0.5, so there's my intercept and my slope coefficients. 
and here's my standard errors. This is the standard error for B0 and the standard error for B1. So in this instance, given that output on that table, I immediately know, without doing any calculation, standard error of B1 is equal to 0 0.1179. And if I needed it, the standard error of B0 is equal to 1.1247. So being able to recognize which entry in this table corresponds to what is, is a critical, critical skill. Okay, I will not talk about the t-values and pr because this is a way to interpret the significance of model coefficients that I prefer not to use. I prefer to use confidence intervals. So I will show you how to get the confidence intervals next. The other piece of information we get is the residual standard error, that's my SE. So standard error in this model. Notice this is not standard error squared, this is just a pure standard error on its own, it's 1.237. R calls us the residual standard error, the same thing. It's the standard error for the residuals. Here we've got the standard error for B1, the standard error for B0. So this is the standard error. If you'd like to interpret this, it's the standard error for the residuals. If you'd like to write a bit more simply. With 9 degrees of freedom, so there's my N minus K. I have 11 data points, N minus K. K is 2 in this instance because we fit B0 and B1. In the next class, we're going to start fitting a B2 and a B3, and then my K is going to be 3, 4, 5. So now K is the number of grams I fit is just 2, the slope of the number. There's my R squared value from 6665, and the adjusted R squared from 6295. And then again, this last line refers to the significance of all the coefficients to the one go is the F statistic, not something that we consider in this course but um, there's certainly a valid outcome as well. So one thing to recognize is that that model.ls is what's called an object. In R's terminology, model.ls is simply an object. And if I want to examine the object, I can type names model.ls. And there it tells me what are the sub-entries in this object. So if, we're, if you're comfortable with object-oriented programming, you know that if you've got an object, you can access the, the structure underlying that object. So here, I can access the coefficients, the residuals, the rank, fitted values, various other sub-components that make up that complete linear model. So as an example, if I type model.ls, and then I use the dollar symbol, I can then access the substructure. I can type model.ls dollar coefficients. And it will get me the slope and the intercept there, respectively. Or I can go residuals. And I will get a vector of the residuals. So I have 11 data points. I can get the residual for data point 1, data point 2, up to the 11th data point. There are other ways of accessing that information, though. Because it's, a, it's an object, I can give that object into certain functions. So R has a built-in function called resid. Resid does probably what you'd expect, it gives you the residuals back. So if I take resid model.ls, it's going to give you exactly the same vector of information back. Resid is a more generic function because resid will accept not only linear models but all sorts of other models and calculate the residuals for you. So either you can use model.ls dollar residuals and access the residuals directly, or you can use the resid function and get the same thing. There's um, another useful function, confint model.ls, which will calculate the confidence intervals for you. So there you go. For the intercept, we get the lower bound at the 2.5% and the 97.5%. So this is a 95% confidence interval for the intercept and 95% confidence interval for the slope, giving me exactly the same values that are in the slides. So that, that should agree with what you see in the slide. You can get confidence intervals at other level of significance. Help confidence will tell you how to do that. So over here on the other side, you can see the confidence interval for one of the parameters in the fitted model. 
I can tell is at which level of confidence. The default is 95% of written in the health over there. So I could simply, if I wanted the 99% confidence intervals, I could say a level equals 0.59. And it would give you return those confidence intervals. One other final thing that's, that's of use is if you want to plot the regression model. So you want, let's say, in R to plot your raw data x versus y and then superimpose onto that, you'd like to see the regression slope and the intercept shown as a, as a straight line. Instead of extracting the coefficients from the model, the intercept and the slope, and then creating a new vector x that spans this range and then plotting it, there's a built-in function that does all the work for you. So if you say plot x versus y, that will plot the x, y data as you expect. But then you can use the ab line function. ab line function will plot straight lines on a graph, given a slope or intercept or a horizontal line or a vertical point. But ab line will also accept objects. And because model.ls is a linear model object that AB line knows how to deal with, um, model.ls, it will then superimpose that least squares line for you. So you don't have to go do all the work of calculating or extracting the coefficients and superimposing it to you want to do it all for you one go. start to look at residuals and we said yesterday one of our assumptions is that the residuals need to be normally distributed. So we can use the QQ plot for that and particularly the car library is great. The QQ plot resid model.lf will do that all for you in one job. So to extract the residuals from the model, send that on to the QQ plot function and that's shown over there. So here our residuals pretty much, other than this point, that's slightly outside the 95% line. Our residuals can be considered to be normally distributed in this particular. Any questions on R using the full sort of linear models? What's the difference between the R squared and Okay, so multiple R squared becomes uh, adjusted R squared becomes important when you start to fit extra terms. Uh, so we right now we're just fitting B zero and B one, but if you go fit B two, B three, B four, R squared actually gets higher and higher. So the adjusted R squared says, well, let, let me not fool myself in thinking that R squared is going to get higher and higher. So it, it shrinks the R squared down to recognize that you fit the extra terms. We'll talk about it when we look at fitting multiple multiple Like now we're just at the case of two. When you put three or four or more terms, then the adjusted R squared is a is a fairer parameter to consider rather than R squared itself. Anything else on this topic? So let's go back then to the slides and um, we've essentially covered all all the information that's on, on the here and, and considered where this comes from. Let's take a look at, at an example then just to end off this class. Um, here's an example of traffic deaths. So number of deaths per thousand kilometers of road network in the country on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is the number of cameras installed per thousand kilometers of road network. So both axes are normalized per length of the road network in the country. Cause and effect. Take a minute just to absorb what the correlation structure is. Think about whether this is cause and effect. And then we'll talk a bit about what the model parameters are.
Okay, so do traffic cameras cause deaths? Do deaths cause traffic cameras? Okay, is there a causal relationship here? Not really. Is, what, is the, what is the general trend? The author of this plot is certainly asking you to infer that countries with higher level of cameras will or should see and experience lower number of deaths on the road. But what, are, what is worrying you? What's concerning you about that particular, particular this assumption that the author is trying to make? Or statement that the author is trying to make? about what this data might mean or what shouldn't mean. But if we look purely at the analysis here, this is the linear model. If I, I took the data and I, I read in the approximate x, y coordinates and I fit that linear model, slope and intercept, the slope is negative 0.7. So it matches what we, what we set up here. But here is the confidence interval for it. So the confidence interval spans zero. What is our interpretation? in the midpoint of minus 1.8.36, as it should be. So 0.7 is there. This interval spans zero, and it spans it more to the negative side. So anything, anything we can say over here? Okay, so there, there likely is a negative correlation. So let's not talk about cause and effect. There's certainly a correlation here amongst the data. There is a negative correlation. Statistically, it's not significant. This interval spans zero. But it certainly indicates that there is a tendency that at higher levels of cameras, we're seeing lower, lower deaths. Now, what's interesting for me is the low level of R squared, 0.07. And the standard error is 10.9. What do we interpret here as my standard error? from that 10.9 value. How, can, how, how might one interpret that? Other than to say that that's the standard deviation of the residual. Yeah. One, one way to look at that number standard error is to contrast it to the range of your y-axis. So recall that standard error refers to the residual size of the y's. And we expect 
70% of our residuals to be plus or minus, let's call this 11. So, so within a range of 22 units on my y-axis, I expect to find 70% of my residuals. So 22 units on my y-axis is pretty big. It's about half the range of my total data set. It's phenomenally large. That standard error is really, really big when I compare it to the range of my y-axis. This is how one should use the standard error. It's a value here of about 11 units. Recall that one plus or minus one standard deviation, so in other words, a range of two standard errors contains 70% of your data. A range of four standard deviations contains 95% of your residuals. Four standard deviations is 44 units. 44 units is pretty much the whole data set. So it says 95% of my residuals span the data set's original range. That's a pretty useless model. Right? If my residuals span the size of my original data set, that's pretty, pretty useless as a, as a standard error. So that's, that's one way to interpret that value. Let's take a look at another example here in the last few minutes we've got. Here's a predictive model where we're taking the millivolts on a thermocouple and using it to predict temperature. So I record the millivolts, I can measure the millivolts without error pretty much, and I can measure the temperature. And on a traditional thermocouple, you can get accuracies of about half a degree on pretty cheap thermocouples. So millivolts measured with little to no error, thermocouple temperature measured within half a Kelvin. Here I've taken some data over a fairly large span of temperature, going from about 270 to 450 Kelvin. There's my model, slope and intercept. And you can, you can think about the, the model intercepts and the slope interpretation of the class. That's not, not difficult. What I would like to focus on here is the R squared value. 0.996, phenomenally high R squared, 99.6%. So if we think back to what our way of thinking was probably a day or two ago, you would have said this model is so good, let's go ahead and use it. It's a great model. It fits my data beautifully, it's gotta be it's gotta be great. But let's take a look at my standard error, 3.9 Kelvin, so four Kelvin. What would you say about the model's use now? Is this, a, is, this still a, is this a good model? Okay, so by R squared's metric, this is a phenomenal model. Like you've probably never seen R squared this high from actual data. From a standard error perspective, you're getting a very different interpretation. The standard error is about four Kelvin, yet traditional or cheap thermocouples can get you about the Kelvin accuracy. Here are my model prediction error. One standard error is four Kelvin, two standard errors is eight Kelvin. You're getting a pretty large standard error. Is this model useful? From the R squared perspective, you might say this is a great model, it certainly is useful. But from the standard error perspective, the model is not useful. It's certainly not useful for this intention of predicting temperature to a high level of access. Okay, so here's what I want you to take away from this is a model's predictive ability should not be judged by R squared alone. A model's ability for what it's going to be used for should be judged based on the situation that where it's going to be done. In this case, if I plan to use the model for prediction, it's going to give me poor, poor performance, certainly worse performance than I can get from a cheap off-the-shelf thermocouple. Okay, so never take away from R squared value whether a model is good or bad. The only way to judge a model is to judge it based on what you intend to use it for. And that might mean you need to use the standard error, it might mean you need to use something else. But your judgment of what the model should be used for is almost never related to R squared value itself. So that's the, that's the message from this particular slide. Next class we'll go on and look at it again back at some of the assumptions of this first model.